Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is one of the most slept on exercises with the K-Box, and that is the K-Box Row. This exercise is going to tick a lot of boxes and really make you fight to hold your posture while working on your pulling power. For this, give yourself a little extra slack with the strap, not too much, but just enough to avoid the jarring action at the top. Give the wheel a good spin, sit your hips back, and fight to hold that position. Pinch your shoulder blades down and back, try to drive your elbows behind you, and keep fighting to not let that wheel pull you forward and make you lose your posture as you go through the exercise. This is an absolutely sensational, big bang for your buck exercise that you and your athletes, I'm sure, will love. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat. Well, you can find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a 100 different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash C-V-A-S-P-S to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Dr. Clark, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, really, really excited to be here talking, uh, talking speed and all, all aspects of uh, athletic performance. So it's great to be here. Yeah, fired up for this one. Uh, before we get going too far, big shout out to Matt Tomey for making this connection. Uh, Matt's been a good friend of mine for what seems to be forever, and it's uh, appreciate him reaching out. But before we get too far into this, you know, for the half of a human being listening who doesn't know who Dr. Ken Clark is, you know, who who are you? Where are you at? And how did you get up there to Westchester? Yeah. Um, so, kind of a quick quick background on on me, I guess is. Um, I think like a, a lot of us, you know, I, I grew up uh, loving sports, but, you know, just was not that genetically gifted, uh, played uh, all sorts of sports growing up, uh, foot, football, hockey, baseball, focused on football, baseball in, in high school. And I played uh, division three uh, football as a running back. Um, so was always just training for, you know, trying to get stronger, faster, mostly for faster 40 yard dash. Uh, genetically, I was too slow even to play division three football if I didn't train for it. So, um, so that's how I got into it. And then, uh, you know, I was a, a grad assistant football coach for two years at the division three level. I kind of gravitated more towards strength and conditioning, moved over from the football side to the strength and conditioning side. Uh, I was a, a strength and conditioning coach for better part of a decade, mostly in the private sector. Um, my undergrad degree was in psychology. Actually, I went to a small liberal arts college that didn't have exercise science. So, um, did, uh, did a master's degree at Westchester University in, uh, in kinesiology. That was my first uh, go round with Westchester. Loved the school. Uh, did a doctorate with, uh, with Peter Wayand and Dr. Larry Ryan at the SMU Locomotive Performance Lab. So I was there with, uh, uh, in Dallas for five years. Loved Dallas. Uh, job opportunity arose back up at Westchester in 2015 to uh, teach uh, in the kinesi department. So that's where I've been for the last uh, five plus years. And uh, I love, uh, love Philly area. Uh, I love my existence at Westchester. I, I teach biomechanics, motor learning. I, I do research and, and sprint biomechanics. And I'm also a volunteer assistant uh, uh, coach, uh, sprints coach with the track team. And I work with some of the other teams in the strength and conditioning um, realm. So kind of get to wear different hats. So it's a, uh, it's a really, uh, it's a really fun existence, and, and uh, that's kind of how I ended up uh, where I am. So That's awesome, man. And I think that Westchester is a school, you know, a lot of people when they talk about, like, programs that put out strength coaches, a lot of people talk about lacrosse. They talk about Cortland. They talk about uh, Springfield. But Westchester's put out some studs. Like, people sleep yeah. on the coaches that have come out of there. <laughs> that, that's a great point, and, and that's a point that we're very proud of. Uh, 
Westchester kinesiology department is, is we've got a really strong history, as you just alluded to, of um, strength and conditioning coaches uh, with a Westchester degree, either undergrad or master's degree from Westchester that are head, head coaches, um, you know, somewhere, whether that's at the high school prep school level, or we have a lot of um, collegiate level head strength coaches. And um, yeah, we, we always uh, talk about wanting to become um, Springfield South, basically. I mean, that's a program that we model ourselves off of and, and um, try to have that same influence. So yeah, it's, it's a great program. And, and um, you know, I've got a lot of pride in, in Westchester, no doubt. So. That's awesome. And I think that, you know, all too often people get really, really excited about all these like ups and downs and ins and outs, the other things, but taking a minute to make sure that we recognize that there are people that are putting out good coaches is really important. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to do that. But what we're really here to talk about is this new thing that's become really this like novel, exciting idea. And that is that we actually want to get people faster and that that's become something that strength and conditioning coaches want to talk about. And um, as someone that's working in track, that's getting people faster. Now, you also spent some time down with Dr. Wayland, who, you know, people would say is kind of the, the leader of the pack when it comes to these things. So let, let's talk about this venture into speed and let's talk about why this has become something that coaches now all of a sudden deem is important. Yeah, great question. And um, uh, obviously, the speed is a, an incredible commodity to have, whatever sport you play, really. And um, I, I think clearly it's become a little bit more in vogue to train speed uh, lately for, for whatever reason. Uh, again, you kind of brought it up. It's, it's, it's not like, to use a double negative, it's not like speed has ever not been important, right? I mean, speed has always been important. I think it's become, you know, more focused on lately in the in the sports performance community. Um, I, I think perhaps one of the reasons for that is um, an enhanced understanding of the facts that uh, are the factors that determine speed and, and certainly researchers like Peter Wayand, you know, are a large part of that and, and um, a better, you know, um, bridging of the gap between the research and the practical application in the, you know, strength and conditioning community. I think once those, you know, underlying performance factors are, are better understood, then it allows those that are working with athletes in a, in a day in day out basis in a hands on, you know, uh, hands on way to, to better train it, frankly. So I think part of that has come from just a better understanding of the mechanical determinants of speed over the last 15, 20 years, that sort of thing. And a large part of that comes from, from good research. On the other hand, I also think that it's just that perhaps in a, you know, um, strength and conditioning world that um, originally the focus was just on the weight room a little bit um, and to the detriment of putting, you know, appropriate focus on getting people faster. And um, I say that, you know, perhaps as a, as a strength coach myself or maybe 15 years ago, um, that's, that's more where my focus was as well, ironically. And, and I think that, you know, now it's, it's perhaps coming into more appropriate balance where people are looking to holistically train the athlete and just realizing that, hey, the, the weight room is a hugely important part of that. But, you know, if we're, what we're doing in the weight room doesn't translate to getting athletes faster, then that's, you know, that's a, a, a problem. That, that's a hole in the training. So um, I think it is a great thing, uh, and I'm playing Captain Obvious here, but I think it is a great thing that people are, are really emphasizing speed training here and not just linear speed, but multidirectional speed, you know, all, all aspects of movement um, in, in their um, training programs. So it certainly is not a novel um, need. I think it's only something that's been better addressed as of more, more recent. So. Yeah. And I think that when we're looking at things as a former division three athlete, also myself, I think that really what's the most important part to start with is where to start. You know, I mean, obviously there's the research and we can look back at, you know, what they've done down at SMU and, and things of that nature. But when you're sitting here and you're looking at your track and field athletes or you're working with the, the young men and women at Westchester that you get to work with in, in the weight room or where, whatever modality you're using, how are you starting with them? How are you implementing these protocols that you've you know, put together and, and learned through your time with, down at SMU and brought up with you to Westchester? Yeah, uh, great question, because that's arguably the most important thing is, 
okay, well, how, how do we connect research and application, right? I mean, all the application, all the research in the world is, you know, has much less utility unless you can apply it to the athletes you're working with. So I think it, it stems in large part, um, and this isn't going to be a rocket science answer, but just from, from keeping it simple and saying, okay, if you look at <clears throat> all of the good biomechanics research on sprinting, whether it's on, <clears throat> on top speed research, like from, from Peter Wayne and colleagues, or acceleration from J.B. Marin and colleagues, I mean, it's all, it's all mass-specific force. The more force you can apply and the faster you can apply it relative to your, to your body mass, I mean, simple physics would tell you that, hey, you're going to run faster. You're either going to Going to accelerate faster or you're going to hit a, a faster top speed and and so um in my opinion you know when we look at ways to train it therefore with the athletes i work with at, at westchester and i want to give a real quick shout out to um head coach jason kilgore uh, at westchester track and field who's uh, kind of my partner in crime there who, who uh programs the the speed training for our, our speed and power athletes but when we when we train our athletes there i mean it all has to do with how can we get them to apply uh, more force and a, and a you know a faster rate of, of force application and, and in the right direction for acceleration or top speed. So anything we're doing on the track, whether it's a, you know a warm up drill, a technique drill, a full speed sprint, whether it's a resisted sprint during acceleration. So anything we're doing on the track or anything we're doing in the weight room from a speed power plyometric standpoint, you name it. I mean it has to be goal directed at, at that. How is this ultimately helping our athletes? Um, apply more force and, and apply the force at a greater rate and and therefore that should help them you know translate into faster speed and on the flip side of that coin if you're doing something and, and you can't immediately answer that question while well, we're doing this exercise or we're doing this drill because of you know this answer if you don't have that answer then it, you know I'm not going to say it's a bad drill but you probably need to re-examine you know your purpose with that why you're doing it that sort of thing so yeah, I, you know, and I think too to, that with today's athlete, even more so, especially I'd garner at the Division three level, if you can't answer that question, like you're you're up a creek without a paddle. No, no kidding. Yeah, and and you know, at this at the smaller college level, and you know, it sounds like we we're both Division three athletes, and I've you know coached uh, primarily at the Division three and the Division two level. I mean, you, you have a very limited amount of time with your athletes, you know, and, and let's not talk about COVID scenarios where, where clearly everything's in, you know, non-traditional scenario right now, but just even under a traditional scenario at the, at the smaller uh, college level, smaller college and university, you have very limited amount of time, either on a track or in the weight room with your athletes. So you, you better make sure that what you're doing counts. So I, I think, you know, uh, effectiveness and efficiency are key there, but but yeah, just you know, going back to the original question, um, making sure that every every drill you're doing, warm up wise, technique wise, you know, full speed sprint, resisted sprint in the weight room, it better be somehow goal and goal oriented towards um, you know the, the simple mechanical goals, applying more force, applying it at a greater rate. So. Yeah, and I think too that you know that kind of piggybacks right into some things that we were talking about beforehand, like half jokingly but half seriously, in that. You know, you talked about J.B. Marin, you talked about, you know, the work again that they're doing down in, in Texas, which has been great. But, you know, there's people that like to jump in these camps and they like to sit here and say, well, no, it's all horizontal propulsion or it's all vertical forces. And really, at the end of the day, if you can't marry the two, you're not going to be doing much of either. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's a great question, great talking point, and I, I think it's one that's worth addressing because um, I, I do think that sometimes there's, uh, whether it's coaches or, you know, uh, people in the sports science community or whatever that, that like to jump into camps, but um, the way I see it, either as a researcher or, or as a coach, it's, you know, it, it, it's one and the same. You, you, in all phases of a sprint, you better be able to apply a lot of force fast and you better be able to apply it in the right direction, whether it's step one or step 21. And, and if you can't, then you're gonna be lacking in some area of, of sprint performance. And you know, what I've seen, I guess, a lot, both as a researcher and coaches, although acceleration and top speed certainly have their differences. I mean, there's no doubt that biomechanically there, there's some differences. But from a coaching standpoint, I think they have more similarities than people often recognize. I mean, having good posture, for example, is always going to be key, whether it's the first step or the 21st step in a sprint. 
having, you know, um, good thigh action and the ability to rapidly scissor the thighs and then strike relatively underneath you with a stiff ground contact. I mean, that's going to be universal to, to the entire, um, the entire sprint. Um, the ability to, you know, basically um, have the right amount of stiffness during ground contact, that's going to be key the entire sprint. So I think sometimes um, more, more complexity is made than necessary when, when really there's some unifying strategies that are great for speed, regardless of what aspect we're, we're talking, initial acceleration, transitional acceleration, top speed. I think it's, there's more unifying principles than not when you, when you look at it like that. So. I love the line, more complexity is made than necessary. I think that that's something that a lot of coaches need to take a step back and, and really look at is that it's, you know, we want to dive into all these crazy new toys and tools and this, that, and the third, but at the end of the day, you know, it, the reason the simple things work and the reason the things that have worked for a long time is because they work. <laughs> That, that's right. I'll, I'll give one great example, and I'll give, a, again, the, the shout out to my, my friend, uh, Coach Kilgore. So when I was first starting to work with the Westchester track team, you know, they, they were doing just a simple A march drill, right, for warm up, which is, of course, everybody does. And, and I, I like those drills. It's all in how you execute it. But then later on in the practice, uh, we were doing some top speed work, and an athlete had, you know, top speed mechanics that, that weren't ideal. And, and, um, and Coach Kilgore said to the athlete, well, I want you to basically sprint at top speed like you're marching. And then that athlete, I mean, that, that resonated with the athlete. He got it. And then another day, he gave the same cue, but it was basically to an athlete who was working on their acceleration mechanics. He's like, hey, you need to accelerate like you're marching just kind of on an angle. And I was like, well, that's, that's a really interesting cue. So you basically told one athlete you want them to march during acceleration and, and another athlete that they should be basically sprinting like they're marching at top speed. I was like, well, which is it? I said, is it, you know, should they feel like they're marching acceleration or top speed? He goes, well, it's both. And I was like, well, and that's when the light bulb went off for me. I was like, yeah, there's just really a lot, a lot more things that, that could be simplified effectively as it relates to, to cueing our athletes and, and bringing home some of the take home mechanics to, to, you know, application as far as we coach them. I, I think a lot of times some of the best cues are the simplest ones that, that help unify those strategies, regardless of what part of the sprint you're in. So. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that, too, when you look at it, it's really hard to take and to separate the parts when it comes from top speed and acceleration to put them together as one thing. But to only train one without the other, I think, is detrimental. Great. So what would you say to coaches then that would say, for example, I work in basketball. What yeah. would you say to a basketball strength coach who says, well, we never hit top speed, yep. whenever we need to train it. So great question. And actually um, a question that I've uh, had to address firsthand over the last uh, six weeks. So um, I'm training an athlete that's a, a Westchester uh, graduate and he's uh, going to play basketball overseas in, in Europe um, in just a few weeks, probably starting around uh, Christmas time. So he just reached out to me. He's actually a former student of mine at Westchester as well. So uh, student, student athlete I know well. And he asked me to um, speed train him for about six weeks and just go twice a week. And so one day a week we do, uh, you know, change of direction agility work because obviously that's key for basketball. I, I would never say otherwise. But another day per week we do linear speed training and, and we do both acceleration and top speed work in, in that linear speed training session. And um, this guy's a very smart student athlete um, and he was an exercise science major. So he kind of gets some of the training concepts. So he was asking me about it. And he, and he asked me that, that very question, you know, just kind of like, well, are we going to do top speed training? I, I said, absolutely. I said, you know, you'll never hit top speed in a game, right? I mean, the, the, the court doesn't allow for it. But I said, are there times when you'll potentially need to hit a fast speed? I was like, look at LeBron's, you know, key block of uh, who was it? Ig Iguodala in, in that game, right? I mean, that's, he's hitting some pretty fast speeds. And, and moreover, even if you don't hit, you know, your peak speed in a game situation, which, which they don't. But even if you don't, I mean, the benefits of top speed training from the stimulus you get at, at high forces in such a short amount of time. And also, I just want my athletes, regardless of what sport they play, to have mastered the fundamental motor skills. 
right? I mean, acceleration and top speed are just a fundamental motor skill. And so just training them to have good mechanics in anything they do to me has value. But, but the number one answer coming back to my second point there is it's a tremendous training stimulus. And so, yeah, with that basketball athlete that I'm working with, and, and to be fair, I don't work with many basketball athletes, but with this athlete, am I doing mostly change of direction, agility, and acceleration? Yes. But will we do a little bit of top speed training? Absolutely. And this guy actually was a high school 800 meter runner, so he's no stranger to sprinting. But I mean, we've gotten him into some really good top speed mechanics in a very limited number of sessions. And to me, that's a value. I mean, we just know what types of forces and what short contact times that's resulting in. I don't have him sprint more than 30 meters, mind you, because that's you know basically relevant to what he's gonna do on a court, but he's approaching top speed at those distances. And, and I think that has benefit to athletes of, of any sport. My, my answer would be similar, even for tennis and volleyball. You know, I mean, it, I wouldn't have them do as much top speed sprinting, of course, but I still think there's benefit to it from a, from a stimulus standpoint. So. No, you know, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the one thing that is really kind of funny is if you put the shoe on the other foot, right? And we were to say, okay, well, they don't hit top speed in sport. Like they don't sprint in sport but they wouldn't move a weight at the pace of a one RM in a back squat, or they wouldn't. They don't squat 400 to... pounds while they're on the court either. Right. I mean, right. they don't clean. Yeah. And we run right to 250. It. So it, yeah. it right. <laughs> Let alone like, lay on their back and touch their chest and press the button. Right. And we run right, right to those <laughs> pun intended. No, exactly. I mean, to me, it's all about uh, the, the difference between, you know, specificity and transfer, right? I mean, things can look sport specific as far as, you know, do they match from a movement demand standpoint what they actually do on the court? And, and sometimes you do want to, you know, obviously be really specific, of course. On the other hand, in my mind, to, to a certain to an extent, it's more important if what you're doing from a training standpoint transfers to better on-court performance. I mean, we wouldn't say that, you know, a top speed sprint looks like what the type of movement necessarily they're doing on the court, but if it transfers and it makes them a better athlete on the court, great. I mean, a, a power clean, you know, to a certain extent, I guess, looks like a vertical jump. And so in that case, you could say it's, it's specific, but it's more important if it transfers. Does it transfer and make them a a better a better player on the court that that to me is the most important question so your 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 point about you know heavy back squats uh at, at whatever at 400 pounds at a, at a low speed of movement is is a, the great the best example of that so well and i think too though when we look at it right doc is it's like that's really the hardest part right now is how yeah. can we quantify transfer yeah agreed. but what we what we know if we're not going to quantify transfer we can at least quantify they're faster or right. they jump higher or whatever change of direction drill or if you're lucky enough to be able to have true agility testing somehow like if those metrics are improving okay. that's different but what we we would probably say may be arguable but what we would probably say is if they're faster and they jump higher they have a better chance of improving their performance than if they clean more and squat more and bench more, unfortunately. Uh, I take an athlete who can sprint faster, jump higher and change the direction better any, any day of the week. Right. I mean, uh, especially if we're talking basketball, but, but almost for every sport. Right. So, so yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So. Yeah. So then Let's talk about where you see things going in the future then, because as a, as a nerd who really likes to dig in and, and talk to the people that are the ones actually crunching the numbers and pulling the stats and looking at what's actually going on, where are you looking moving forward and where do you see these research methods going when it comes to whether it be speed or true agility or transfer or whatever it may be when it comes to the the real sports science realm of the world of sport? Yeah, tremendous question. So um, in my mind, uh, where I see it going is, is actually a, a coming together of, I guess, what you would call pure scientific research versus, um, you know, strength and conditioning coaches, sports performance coaches that are working in a team setting. The most important research that's happening now, but I think where it's even going to go even more so is, 
um, good training studies in a team setting, because I think understanding the underlying mechanisms that determine performance is, is huge. I mean, you need to know that first to have evidence-based programming. But once you kind of have those laid out for whether it's sprinting or jumping or change of direction, once you have some of those um, uh, big rocks understood scientifically and biomechanically from a performance standpoint, now you need to see what works. But, but training studies are very hard to do from kind of like a research method standpoint. But, but training studies within a team setting like that have ecological validity as far as, well, this is what a team might actually do over the course of eight to 10 to 12 weeks in their off season period. Um, I, I think that's next. It, it's starting to happen more and more where, you know, collegiate level or professional level teams are actually, you know, doing training studies, even if that just means dividing the team up into two and they, they mostly do the same program, but half the team you know, tweaks one variable slightly and the other team doesn't. So you have some sort of, you know, experiment versus control group um, to put it in, in really simple terms. I, I think that just having kind of the basics understood is great. The next step is saying, okay, can we implement this, but in a realistic team-based scenario to try to figure out, you know, does this actually make an impact with athletes that are, you know, high level? I think just to, to tie a bow on that point, a lot of training studies that exist, and, and this is in no way a criticism of, of the training studies that use this population, but a lot of training studies are done with just recreationally, uh, recreationally trained subjects because that's who it's easy to recruit. You know, you just get physical education students from your university and, 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 and those training studies are, are great. I'm not taking anything away, but I think the next step is okay, but, but what about in athletic populations, like a D2 or a D1 or a professional level population? Because it's those populations that are hardest to get the training gains in. And, and that's where we can really see if what we're doing, you know, is, is, um, is having an effect. So I, that's where I see it going, is, is more and better longer term. When I say longer term, I mean, you know, even if it's just a semester long, um, training studies to try to determine what the outcome is of, of manipulation of certain variables. And there's lots of great groups that are, that are, that are doing those and I think more and more will. Um, and I'll, I'll stop hogging the oxygen and, and let you uh, talk here in a second, Jay. I, but I ultimately think that that's what brings, you know, kind of the, the quote unquote scientists and the, and the sports performance coaches together. I mean, it's not research or coaching, right? It's, it's not one or the other, the best coaching programs you know, strength and conditioning, performance, whatever, they've always been mini research experiments. I mean, all the best coaches have already done that, where they're doing pre-testing and post-testing and monitoring their athletes. It's perhaps more just doing it in a formally way that can be, you know, peer reviewed and disseminated to everybody. So I, I, that's what I see. And that's a good thing. I, I see those I see those two fields coming together as really the next step, even more than they currently do. So. No, I, I would love that. And I think that what's would actually add more to that is if coaches would start to actually talk about the results they get. But that I think is going to be, I don't know if everyone is quite ready to give all that out because you still go to a lot of these bigger symposiums and you hear, well, this is this team speed training. And it's like, these are all the pretty drills and exercises and toys we have, but we don't see any times. Right. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, you're right. There, there'll be a, a certain amount of transparency that, that's necessary, I, I suppose. It, it's my, I guess it's my hope, perhaps naive, that, that um, you know, that sort of thing will um, progress and, and, you know, there'll be more uh, better, better long-term studies. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that's what I, that's what I see as next. And I, and I see, you know, I mean, the, the strength and conditioning field has evolved uh, in many ways tremendously over the last, you know, decade, two, two decades. I think there's still areas, you know, where, where clearly we, we need to get better, but um, the amount of, of evidence and science-based programs that exist, and then the amount of data collection that goes on, I mean, is, is just light years ahead of where it was, you know, back when I was a college athlete, for example, <laughs> back, in the, back in the relative stone ages. And so I, I think that opportunity is, is there for sure. So. No, I couldn't agree more. And I don't know if it's necessarily something that everyone's ready for, but I think that there is a group of coaches that are starting to move that way. And I think yeah. that that's, that that's really cool. But listen, you know, Ken, before we get out of here, let me, let me get you able to do this. Like, 
you put out a lot of great stuff. You share a lot of great content. We need to make sure that everybody knows and has access to that. So where can people go to see more of what you're doing and, and keep, keep up to date with all that? Yeah, th thanks for uh, giving me that, uh, that opportunity. So um, uh, my, my social media handle is just at Ken Clark Speed, um, all, uh, all one word there. And then uh, excited to announce that uh, somewhat recently, probably about two months ago at this point, launched uh, KenClarkSpeed.com and uh, launched that website really as a, as a housing platform for everything that I'm doing um, research-wise, uh, coaching-wise, uh, that, that sort of thing. Uh, social media. So KenClarkSpeed.com and, and at KenClarkSpeed is where you can follow me and, um, you know, uh, look forward to, to having some uh, continued research and, and also, you know, kind of updates on what we're doing from a coaching standpoint uh, put out there as well. So That's awesome. And, and we'll make sure that that's all in the notes, Doc, so that people can keep up with all that and that they can, you know, check all that out and follow you with that because you are putting out some great stuff and, and it's, you know, truly appreciate your time and, and even more appreciate the work you're doing to help all of us be better because if it wasn't for people that were actually working in both sides, then I think that we would still be having kind of these, these fake fights about, you know, <laughs> what we need to squat and how we need to do this and that instead of actually talking about, you know, it, it, it's a crime not to time, right? Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that. I yeah, stole that well, from Carl Val, so I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> I might owe Carl like 10 cents for that right now. Yeah, we're all, we're all just thieves, right? We've all stolen from other places. But no, I, I, uh, I appreciate it. your time today as well, Jay. It's been uh, fun talking with you. And uh, yeah, look, uh, look forward to, you know, just uh, continuing to, to coach and research. And I'm sure we'll, you and I will be talking more in the future. So. Yes, sir, 100%. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ken. We'll be in touch right. real soon. All right, great. Thanks. Cheers.